hello everyone welcome again to my youtube channel so today i'm going to be discussing something very very important someone had asked me if i could discuss you know um, the dic and east laboratory features okay so what is dic dic talks about that inseminated intravascular coagulation okay so we are going to look at this in detail so we're going to look at what this very dic means and also what can you see in the laboratory what what are the features that when you see in the laboratory it can then suggest that maybe there's a that this may be due to dic once again my name is dr emmanuel obodo i've been working in the uk as a specialist biomedical scientist and i'm a lecturer in biomedical science so yeah let's get into this so now, when you talk about DIC, there is something I want you to understand. Can I just take us back a little bit when we talk about prolonged APTT or prolonged uh, PTR now, maybe because someone is on anticoagulant. Now, let me ask us a question. Why would a doctor prescribe anticoagulant for a patient? Why would that be the case? Remember that under normal condition, your body, your blood supposed not to clot except if there is an injury okay, or any form of trauma that damage the blood vessel that may lead to bleeding. So that is the only way that naturally your body should not activate clotting factors and of course platelet will be activated. All the whole, the whole mechanism is just to stop that very bleed from happening, okay, or just to stop that very bleeding. Now, do you realize that in some cases, what would they make a doctor prescribe anticoagulant? Because anticoagulant means something that stops coagulation. In other words, something that stops blood clotting. Something that stops blood from clotting. Okay? Now, if a doctor gives someone anticoagulant in the system, that means there is something going on in the system of that very patient or individual. Remember that in the laboratory, we have different anticoagulated bottles. So we have EDTA anticoagulant, we have sodium citrate, we have sodium fluoride, uh, fluoride and all of that. So we have different anticoagulants. So we use this anticoagulant to stop the blood from clotting. Remember again that in the lab, when you collect a blood on a plain tube, what will happen? The blood is going to clot with time. But when you collect a blood on anticoagulant, it will not clot because there is anticoagulant. As a matter of fact, the only time a sample that is on anticoagulated bottle can clot if it was not properly mixed. Now, what am I trying to say? What should what that's supposed to be in a sample tube be in a human being? The reason is this. When somebody's system starts forming clots, without any cause because your system of the blood clot supposed to be formed if there's a trauma if there's an injury that system that system should not activate the clotting factors activate platelet the whole idea the whole mechanism is to stop or limit that bleeding you see now but when for some reasons for some conditions someone's system start clotting without any cause you see now once there's abnormal blood clot in the system of an individual without any cause that's abnormality and because of that sudden clot that can happen without any cause this is why a doctor can prescribe anticoagulant to a patient is it now so that doctor is prescribing that anticoagulant to the patient because that will not help it will not prevent the body of that very patient or individual from forming clot so anyone that have abnormal uh, clotting disorder whereby the body starts forming clots without any reason that is the likely cases or the likely situation or scenario where the doctor may then prescribe anticoagulant for that patient now let us bring this into dic so when you talk about dic you are talking about abnormal clot blood clot in the blood vessels so when there's abnormal clot in the blood vessels there's no injury nothing is going on there's no trauma but because of that condition there's then abnormal clot in that very indiv uh, individual blood vessel that is called dic why should that be the case that is the case because the blood the protein that help in the blood clotting such as the clotting factors like fibrinogen they become overactive and when these very proteins that you know helps in the blood clotting becomes overactive, due to that their overactivity, okay, what would then happen that they will start forming clots unnecessarily? You see it now. And when that thing start happening, what do you think that will happen to the system? Let me go a little bit different. Remember that the blood is the whole blood, 
And as a whole blood, you have the cell, you have the plasma or serum, serum as the case may be. Now, with the help of the serum or plasma, that is why the blood is like a fluid. You see it now? And being a fluid, it helps the body, it helps the blood then to circulate from your heart to every part of the body. So when you talk about close circulation or double circulation, as the case may be, where your blood, you know, continues to circulate to every part of your body, it is possible because of that fluid. That very serum or plasma, because the other content is their cells. You see it now. But now when they do that, remember again that when you eat food and your food digests, that nutrient from the food, okay, once the body extracts it through the blood system, okay, through the circulatory system, it cannot pass this nutrient to every part of the body. That is how your, your brain cells, your every part of your cells get this nutrient and they continue to grow and, and so on, okay. Now, if for any reason there is obstruction, because I've not talked about circulation. So if there's any reason in the obstruction, that can cause damage in a lot of blood or internal organs. For example, now if there is DIC where there's abnormal blood clot, what will happen is that that abnormal blood clot in the blood vessel will cause obstruction in that very blood vessel. And that obstruction then will limit the blood flow. You see it now. And when you limit the blood flow, these are the reasons why maybe you can get someone being, you know, having stroke and all of that. So that very limitation in the blood flow can then may affect internal organs such as the kidney, such as the liver. Why? Because remember I said this blood is supposed to be circulated. You see it now without any obstruction because that is how it can pass nutrients, it can pass you know all kinds of materials required by every part of the body as regards to the cells, you know, and nutrients and all of that. But that obstruction will limit that, and the limitation of that can, may then affect any of these very internal organs. Now, let's bring this to what the question is really. So now when somebody has DIC, what does it mean? I've just said that it means that the basic blood system, the basic blood system, the blood clot is forming abnormally without any cause. And when there's abnormal blood clot formation in the blood vessel, that is called DIC. Is it now? So now that we've known what DIC is, let us look at what are the laboratory features. I'm not just going to give you the laboratory features. Remember, we are scientists, so we need to try to know the reason why we say what it is. For an example, now, think about it this way. If there's abnormal blood clot in the system, okay, because of this very condition called DIC, what do you think will happen? It means then that the platelet count has been activated during this very clot. It also means then that the clotting factors has also been activated because, remember, there cannot be any blood clot with that activation of the clotting factors without activation of the platelet okay so and so on because remember that the final point of clot formation whether from the intrinsic or extrinsic as we have discussed there's a common pathway okay where of course you get fibrinogen and again that fibrinogen being converted to fibrin is what that will lead to the clot formation you see it now? So clot don't just form. So fibrinogen will not just be activated or converted to fibrin. A lot of things happen from the intrinsic pathway, from the extrinsic pathway to the common pathway where you can get the fibrinogen, then converted to fibrin, then to form a clot. Okay? So what it means then, if there is a blood clot in the blood vessel due to this very DIC, it means that the platelet has been activated. Remember, platelet also play a function, plays a role in the blood clotting. So it means that the platelet has been activated, okay? Again, it means that the clotting factors have been activated, okay? What does that mean? It means that the platelet count of the patient is going to be low. Because if the platelet count has, if the platelet has been activated in forming this very clot in the blood vessel, when you measure the platelet count of that very patient, okay, that will be low. So you are going to get thrombocytopenia. Now, because for that clot to be formed, there's going to be activation of the clotting factors. Okay, of course, getting to the fibrinogen. Fibrinogen will be used and converted to fibrin to form a clot. It then means then you can get low, fibr low fibrinogen. Is it now? And again, it means then that you can get low clotting factors. And that means then if there's a low clotting factor or insufficient clotting factors, remember we'll talk about either due to deficiency in the clotting factor or inhibitor. I just want you to think like that now. So now because of most of those clotting factors has been activated 
during the, during these processes. What it means then is that if you do the PTR of the patient, or if you do the APTT of the patient, it's going to be prolonged. It's going to be prolonged because most of the clotting factors that should help that very PTR or APTT result to be normal has been used to form this very clot in the blood vessels. So I've mentioned thrombocytopenia, I've mentioned a raised or prolonged PTR and prolonged APTT. Then there's also another thing. Because of there is a clot in the system, in the blood vessel, you now start having the debris. Remember what I taught you guys about FDP, which is fibrin degraded product. So this very FDP then would then be circulating in the system. What it means then that the D-dimer will be raised. Okay, so you're going to have raised D dimer. So under coagulation, okay, another platelet is under um full blocker. Then under coagulation, you're going to get prolonged PTR now, you're going to get prolonged APTT, you're going to get raised D dimer, low amount of the platelet count, low amount of the fibrinogen. Okay, and of course, you're also going to get low amount of deficiency or low amount of the clotting factors as well, like I've said. Okay, so these are the features that you can see. There are other features you can see, maybe for example, in things like the full blood count. In full blood count, you're going to get a low platelet count. Now, there is also another thing that will happen. Remember that it is a blood that is clotting, it is a red, red blood cell is clotting during the process. And because of that red blood cell clotting, what do you think will happen? What will happen is that hemoglobin will be low. Red blood cell will be low. Therefore, DIC is associated with anemia. What is anemia? Anemia talks about low hemoglobin or low hematocrit or low red blood cell. So, and what there is very blood clot in the system, in the blood vessels, that will reduce. That means that most of the blood in the system, most of the red blood cells have been clotted. By this very disorder, that would then lead to anemia. Are you following? So that means that in the full blocker, you will get anemia. You know, of course, the red blood cell will be low, hemoglobin will be low, you're likely to get hematocrit to be low, and so on. So now I've mentioned low platelets in full blocker, I've mentioned um, anemia. Now let us look at this anemia in detail. How can DIC cause anemia? DIC is going to cause anemia by, you know, different type of, in different ways. Number one is thrombosis. What is thrombosis? Thrombosis talks about excess blood clotting. Once there's excess blood clotting, that is thrombosis, okay? Now, once there's that thrombosis, that means there's a lot of uh, red blood cells that have been arrested during that clot, and of course, that will lead to anemia. And during that very process, uh, there's going to be a consumption of high amount of the platelet and the clotting factor because they are going to be used, you know, to do that, to, you know, to be able to clot that very blood in the blood vessel. And this very thrombocytopenia and anemia is also associated when there's a mechanical disruption of the red blood cell and platelets by coagulation in this very blood vessel, which is microvasculature. So, meaning that the thrombocytopenia and anemia is can also be associated when there's a mechanical, remember about the tissue factor that is being released, okay, okay, and that can activate platelet. Anyway, so once there's a mechanical destruction of these very platelet and red blood cells, okay, you know, uh, by, due to this uh, coagulation that is occurring in the microvasculature, like the blood vessels, that can then lead to the thrombocytopenia and anemia. So do you see how this is associated, like I've explained before, okay? Now, let us look at other features you will see, especially when you talk about things like uh, blood film morphology. What will you see in the blood film morphology? So, in the blood film morphology, obviously, you know you are going to see thrombocytopenia, meaning there's going to be low amount of the platelet. You're going to see something like large platelet, okay? You will see large platelet. Another thing you can see is something like fragmented red cells or what we call schistocytes. Then you can also get something like helmet cells. So these are the things, the likely features you are going to see. So when they present a morphology for you, there's a lot of things. Don't forget about hemolytic anemia anyway. But for the purpose of this, once they present a feature for you and you see, see something like schistocytes or which you, what we call fragmented red cells, you are seeing thrombocytopenia, you are seeing something like large platelet or helmet cells, you should start thinking about DSA. So these are the features that you can see in the blood film morphology when a patient is having DIC. Okay. Now let us talk about what are the stages of DIC. There are three main stages, or let me put it this way: DIC can be divided into two, either acute or chronic. Acute is when it is sudden; it can happen suddenly. While the chronic is actually when it happens gradually. So there are two forms of DIC: you can have acute, you can have chronic. Okay. Now, in addition to that. 
DIC can be grouped into three stages, three main stages. Okay, number one, you can have hypercoagulation. What is hypercoagulation? From the word hyper, it means it means increase or prolong or high. So hyper means high. So coagulation of course blood clotting. So what there is high amount of the blood clot or excess blood clot that is called hypercoagulation. That is one of that is a one of the stage of um, DIC. Then number two, you have compensated, which can also called subclinical so you have compensated or subclinical uh, form of DIC. So what happened in this occasion is that remember that one that that very um clotting one that that abnormal clot is activated okay that abnormal clot that is being activated before the clot will be formed there's going to be activation of the clotting factor like we said platelet and all of that what happened in compensated and subclinical form of DIC is that there's going to be an inhibition now don't forget what we discussed about when we are investigating why there is a prolonged PTR or APTT. One of the things we mentioned, okay, is the patient is not an anticoagulant. One of the things we mentioned was that there could be a factor deficiency or there could be an inhibitor. So there are some natural uh, anticoagulants in the system, okay, like when you talk about like something like protein C, okay, these are natural anticoagulants in the system. So what will happen is that in the compensated or, or subclinical aspect of the DIC, what happens is that once there is this activation of the abnormal blood clot in the blood vessel, the body will release, okay, this inhibition, okay, and this inhibition can help to slow down that very process. Okay, that is called compensate. That means it has compensated that abnormality. It doesn't mean there's not going to be any blood clot, okay, but it will slow the process down, okay. It will slow it down, okay. Try to regulate some things, not to, not to allow it to happen the way it could have happened when it was a hypercoagulation. So, in terms of the compensated or subclinical, uh, there's an inhibition which can be as a result of the release of the natural anticoagulant which can slow down that very process of abnormal clots. I hope that makes sense. And uh, how it can do that? Remember that, you know, um, there will be a release once uh, there's a, a clot is trying to form. There's going to be, uh, for our platelet, of course, to be activated. There's going to be a release of the tissue factor like I've mentioned. And that tissue factor release is what that will then activate the thrombin. And thrombin activation, of course, leading to the fibrinogen, then to fibrin, then will lead to clot. So what this very uh, natural anticoagulant will do is to try to slow down this process. That will limit the speed at which that very clot can form. So that is called compensated or subclinical form of DIC. Then we have all compensated or fulminant form of DIC. What is going on here? Unlike the compensated that did something about the abnormal. No, this one is not necessarily going to do something about the abnormal. That is why it is uncompensated or fulminant. So what is happening here is that because of there's an abnormal clot formation in the blood vessel, there's going to be a lot of consumption of the platelet clotting factors. And once most of these very clotting factors and the um, platelet has been consumed, you know, have been used up, what do you think will happen? There's going to be a major hemorrhage. You see, now, there's going to be a profuse bleeding. Okay, so without any slowing down, so that form of DIC then is called uncompensated or fulminant form of DIC. So I've mentioned three forms of DIC, apart from the two ways I've mentioned about acute and chronic, I've mentioned three forms. In the three form, there's a hypercoagulation where the blood clot, you know, is high, okay, there's excess blood clotting, okay. Now I've mentioned the second one, the second one is where there's a release of inhibition that can stop that, that very clot, okay, from happening, so it can slow it down, okay. Now the third one is this. That clot formation is going to use up a lot of platelets, it's going to use up a lot of clotting factors, and that way the body, the system will become vulnerable. Because of there's a low uh, platelet, there's low clotting factors, okay, what do you think will happen? What will then happen? It may lead to profuse bleed. Is it now? Let's go bleed. The platelet has drastically been reduced, platelet uh, clotting factors have drastically been reduced. With meaning that the clot is no longer able to form the way it's supposed to be formed and that can lead to bleeding. I hope this makes sense though. When you go for your interview and they ask you about DIC or uh, the features, laboratory features, these are the things you can say. One of the things I keep telling you guys, you know, when you go for interview, try to go beyond, uh, try to answer generically. What I mean is this, for example, now, I've said a lot of things on this video. Now, though the person that asked me to do this video said, if I could make a video on DIC 
and its laboratory features. That's what I've done. So if you want to go straight to the answer, you say, okay, DIC means that is terminated uh, intravascular coagulation where there's abnormal clots in the blood cyst in the blood vessels. You see now. You can stop that and say the features include thrombocytopenia, you know, raise prolonged APTT, prolonged PT RNR, you know, uh, you can say anything that you want to say, like I've already said. But you can also decide to go further and explain in detail some of the things I've said. Now, sometimes you might go for an interview, they will ask you what is DIC. Don't just say the full meaning and don't talk about define DIC. You can also say all these things that we've said. Anyway, here you go. When they ask you any question on DIC, you know, how it relates to the coagulation abnormality. They can also ask you questions about how DIC can lead to coagulopathy. These are the things that you can mention in any way it comes. Anyway, here you go. If you have any question, please put it on the comment section. And of course, like, share, subscribe. And let me know what you think about the video. Thank you very much till I come back away again. I wish you all the best.